So let's start with refractive cataract surgery and looking at the premium IOLs, starting with presbyopia correcting IOLs. It's unfortunately a little bit dismal. It is closer to A. Eric, thank you. Um, so since its uh, uh, implantation or, or implementation in 2006, there was a nice sharp adoption, and then it kind of has been stagnant between 4 to 5 percent since 2008. And then let's look at toric IOLs. And when we look at Warren Hill's data, uh, over 6,000 eyes, we know that at least 52, if not more, percent of patients have visually significant corneal astigmatism enough to warrant a toric IOL. But the penetration is not that high. So toric IOLs, since its introduction in 2009, great sharp adoption initially, but it really has kind of fallen into that 6 to 8 percent in, uh, range um, since 2010. So for overall, the advanced technology IOLs comprise about 12 to 13 percent of the IOLs being implanted today. So in the U.S., there's at least favorable reimbursement, so we have that going for us, and this might be why our numbers are, are higher here than around the world, because beyond uh, the cash-based service, at least the cataract surgery itself is reimbursed. Uh, but if you actually look at the outside U.S. experience, most of them have to ha uh, pay for it entirely um, <coughs> out of pocket at private pay facilities. And so at least the good news is there is demand around the world, and you see here that USA does uh, lead in terms of market penetrance of these technologies. Now looking at femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgeries, this is very, very good to see that since it was introduced just a few years ago, um, about one in 10 cataract surgeries are being performed with laser assistance. Um, that learning curve may be the reason, so there's greater comfort and surgeon efficiencies, uh, good marketing, as well as uh, being numerous platforms on the market that are FDA approved today could uh, account for why 9.5% of cataract surgeries are with LACS. So switching gears to corneal refractive procedures and laser vision correction. So globally, the refractive numbers are down. And the orange bars are the US, uh, Japan, and Europe is in that sea green. And as you can see in that little top, the snow caps, there's an incline of laser vision correction procedures in India and China. But the peak of what was being done in the US of about 1.4 million was in 2007, right before the market crash and the recession. And as you can see, it's only gotten worse over time. Um, and then, you know, there are other procedures that are uh, maybe taking away, uh, especially OUS and the small procedure. There are some numbers there. And then we're very fortunate to have Dr. Nick Tarantino, who will be talking a little bit about the AccuFocus uh, and the corneal inlay experience. So just, you know, why has adoption been less than robust? I mean, are, are there really limitations that are, you know, the number one reason, either perceived or real? We know laser vision correction and toric IOLs, those are two really great technologies that can provide life-changing um, options for our patients. And so there's, there are intangibles, intangible reasons that are creating these barriers to adoption. And so fortunately for us today, we have four different companies who have FDA-approved premium market um, products who will be speaking with us, and Dr. Nick Tarantino is first, and he is with AccuFocus serving as the Global Chief Clinical and Regulatory Affairs Officer. So Dr. Tarantino. Thank you. So um, first, we're going to talk about two products today that are really changing the way that surgeons are using to correct uh, presbyopia, uh, both in presbyopic patients and now with cataract patients with the IOL. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about the camera inlay. The camera inlay was approved last year, just about this time. And inlays have really taken off now in the United States, really meeting our expectations and actually exceeding them. And part of the reason for that is what's gone into the development of the camera inlay. First of all, the camera inlay, it's very thin. It's six microns. It occupies virtually no space, about the size of a red blood cell. And on top of that, it has a curvature that matches the cornea. So there's very little disruption of the corneal surface. And uh, so the tear film is able to be maintained. So as I mentioned, it was approved uh, this time last year. And the um, adoption of this is really, really doing very, very well. We have well over 2,000 in the United States already implanted. And we have about an 82 and a half percent um, readoption rate or reorder rate. You can't get more than that because we're doing a nice slow rollout. Because uh, those who just 
got the product have not had the opportunity to reorder. But again, it's about a 200% increase, so it's really doing well. So let's take a look at the data that we've seen. And what we're getting is from uncorrected visual acuity, we're getting, a, and these are from marketed patients, those that have been commercially implanted, <clears throat> implanted as opposed to those uh, from our clinical trials. We're getting about a 2025 uncorrected distance visual acuity with J2. And when we target correct that for minus three quarters of a diopter, we actually improve the results, particularly early on, without any, without any disruption of the distance visual acuity. So what does this mean? What it means is that as surgeons go ahead and advertise for this type of a product, two things happen. One, it allows to bring back patients who are previous refractive patients who are now entering presbyopia. And then it also allows to be able to compound the dividends from that advertising and bring patients in who then can uh, qualify for other types of procedures. And this is the pull through that has been mentioned earlier that has been really successful. We're going to talk a little bit about the IOL now, the IC8. The IC8's been an investigation in uh, Europe and just now being launched commercially. The IC8 standard type of uh, one-piece IOL, but really what's specific about this is the small aperture optics and the high ABI number provide for a really nice, good image quality. And we're going to take a look at that. But first, let's look at the defocus curve. What we're seeing here is in green is the typical defocus that we're seeing uh, with the standard implantation of the lens. And as we target minus three quarters of a diopter, we're going to see a nice flat curve. We extend the amount of near vision we're getting to about two and three quarters of a diopter at 2032 without any effect on distance vision. So it's really been doing well. So one of the reasons why, why is this happening? What's going on with this particular situation? What we see is because this shows the modulation transfer function of small aperture optics. And blue is the IC8. The other eye, which is implanted with a monofocal, we see in gray. And we can see the area under the curves of these is really a lot better. So we're getting really good image quality. And when we take a look, at the image quality in terms of resolution relative to other products that are currently on the market. In this type of category, we see why the vision is so good when we look at the top, which is the uh, IC8. The other thing that's really important is the ability for this to not only correct um, these uh, uncorrected types of uh, amotropias that are going on, but as far as astigmatism, we're able to get up to a diopter and a half of astigmatism correction with this particular IOL and still not lose a line of vision. So the ability to be able to use this and not have to um, worry about situations in terms of um, having to use a an, an astigmatic type correction. Finally, the thing that happens is that we also are seeing an, an effect whereby the lens is able to treat lower order aberrations. We're seeing a great effect on those patients who are previous refractive patients. A lot of the surgeons have claimed that, as well as patients who've had trauma. I'm going to leave it right here with these uh, quotes that we have seen from doctors. First of all, Matteo Piavella believes that this type of technology is going to revolutionize this type of uh, procedure. Uh, Burkhard Dick has indicated that it is uh, really the IOL for just about every person because it has none of the downsides of multifocal IOLs in terms of dysphotopsias at all, yet still provides good uh, depth of vision. And finally, one of the most important is from Dr. Morselli, who has indicated that this is a great type of product for patients who've had previous refractive surgery and therefore to be able to correct for those, some of those lower order, or lower order aberrations. Thank you. So before you leave the stage, so real quick, Nick, um, do we have any questions from the panel? Uh, Nick, thanks so much. Great talk. I think we've all been really excited about the introduction of the camera. This has been, this has been uh, uh, quite the buzz, you know, certainly in the cornea refractive field. Um, there's a couple of exciting other inlays that are coming on the market real soon as well. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge for camera going forward and over the next five years? Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question because really anytime there's a first of a kind product, um, the market really has to be primed for it and, and, and to be ready. One of the things that we've seen that's really important for this is that the uh, rollout is slow 
and that the surgeons are perfectly trained. I've been involved with several first-of-a-kind products, and you don't want to have to learn that lesson really more than once, and I think this time we've really learned it. That it has to be a slow, methodical type of rollout with excellent training to maintain those good results. And finally, we're really looking forward to the um, other marketed inlays coming through because we believe that's going to help to build the, the, uh, the market of, uh, of inlays. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Um, so next up is Andrew Chang, who serves as the Bausch & Lomb General Manager and VP for U.S. Surgical. And if you could also stand Sage after, that'd be great. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Yu. Um, we're going to provide our perspective on the premium channel and what we're working towards. So about three years ago, we really reestablished Bausch & Lomb Surgical to have a growth and development path. And what does that mean? So we took our business and turned it around and use, utilize the revenue growth and our business growth to really drive innovation. So what, we have, what have we done so far? So over 70 companies we surveyed around the world in different enabling technologies. We put 32 projects, R&D projects, on the map that's ongoing today. And also, and hopefully by the end of 2016, we'll launch 23 new products in the space within cataract, refractive, and retina, and all within premium channel uh, flavors too. So within all the therapeutic areas, we actually lead the charge within uh, surgical, and we're really proud of that because we all know here today that you need innovation to continue that type of growth. And that type of growth is really fueled by our surgeon partnership, which is driving patient outcomes, education, and R&D. So just to list a few here that are involved with at ASCRS, we have a huge panel, a lot of surgeons that are helping us create and innovate. One of the surgeons that's helping us, Dr. Hovanesian, was answering one of the questions that was out there for quite some time, which is about long-term quality of vision and what does that mean? So he brought back over 100 patients that were on accommodating and also on multifocals. And what we wanted to find out was how stable were, were the platforms? Are they, are, do they like their outcomes? Would they refer it to a family? Because that ultimately that is what is important today to all of us to drive the premium channel. And of course what we found is most of them really like their technology and what they have in their eyes. But also, what was really telling for us is the lifestyle change that has occurred within the last five years. If you think about our world today, it's not just about reading up close, it's about intermediate and distance vision. And what kind of vision can we offer for a lifetime? So what we found is obviously within the Bausch & platform that we had less clear in halos, and that matters especially for night driving and also, um, uh, also the dashboard intermediate vision. So that brings us to the next topic. Our next KOL, our next person we work with, Warren Hill, he gave me some really enlightening information. So what he said was he looked at over 200,000 calculations, and this is what's, what the results were, that less than 1% of the surgeons were actually received an A in terms of accuracy. 6% received a B in terms of these surgeons. And the vast majority, unfortunately, received a C grade or 76% to 80% accuracy. So as a company, we knew that this is the biggest area that we can improve upon immediately. And how do we make this simple? And how do we make this decision-making process a lot more intelligent? So as of this morning, we announced our partnership with IBM and Apple and utilizing their ecosystem. So we're really proud of what you can do together, bring Silicon Valley to ophthalmology. Um, and we could certainly talk a little bit more about that later on, but we're really happy with this partnership to really utilize their ability to, uh, to, to, to utilize cognitive thinking, cognitive computing, uh, the cloud, and also utilizing the Apple ecosystem to help us innovate and also make those choices better for our surgeons and our patients. So thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing and allowing us to give us the time to share our innovation and our passion Well, we do. We certainly have time for questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Andy. Uh, I, I just had a, two questions. Um, one uh, regarding the uh, excellent data on the crystal lens. Uh, although I appreciate the value of the of the product offering, I think the elephant in the room uh, is the absence of the of uh, a multifocal option in uh, Bausch and Lomb's lineup. So I was wondering. Uh, what is Bausch & Lomb's answer for patients who desire better than J3, which many surgeons do struggle to get with the crystal lens platform? 
and will you be entering the multifocal market? Yeah, thank you for, for asking that. So we are looking at different technologies around the world um, in different designs. So we have an ongoing project right now for, for multifocality, but we also don't want to trade off the quality of vision. So you gotta remember our, mis our mission and vision is for long-term vision for our patients. So if we can find that happy medium, uh, we definitely will bring it to market, but it is on one of the 32 projects. And then also for, um, for the announcement with the um, cloud, yeah. it, are you speaking about it, an app that's gonna have the capability to maximize IOL calculations? That is, that is absolutely the goal. Maybe we could bring Watson here next time and he can answer okay. it. <laughs> and and will, that, will that be just for B&L products or will that be yeah. all? It, initially, absolutely right. So we will focus on making our products easier and also giving the choice to go into the premium channel a lot easier as well. And then after we refine that, then we'll, we'll look at different ways that we can do from a regulatory process and how we can expand beyond that. Thank you. All right, thank thank you. you, Andy, for all that insight. So next we have for Abbott Medical Optics, Leonard Borman, who is the Divisional Vice President of Research and Development. Thanks, Dr. Yu, and thank you to the OIS organizers for the opportunity to join you this afternoon and uh, share <laughs> Abbott's view on the premium IOL category and what we're doing to hopefully continue to expand that in the future. Uh, as you can see from the graph here, uh, the uh, Premium IOL category is one of the fastest growing categories in surgical ophthalmology. Uh, and that's predominantly driven by new technologies that are introduced uh, that, or that have been introduced over the last couple of years throughout the world. Uh, and in 2015, MarketScope projected that there'd be a little more than 440,000 premium IOLs that would be implanted uh, and about a 5% compounded growth rate uh, in this category over the next five years. And as you heard from Dr. Yu's uh, opening remarks, uh, while this growth is uh, pretty compelling given the growth in cataract surgery in general, uh, the category itself is significantly underpenetrated uh, with less than 15% of the total IOLs uh, implanted in the US uh, being of premium quality or premium nature. Uh, and it's even more compelling when you think that some, some uh, practices are capable of of converting 50 to 70% of their patients to premium IOLs while others aren't. And so what does Abbott uh, believe we need to do to continue to expand uh, and to realize the true potential of the category? Well, the first thing is, as you heard from the previous panel in diagnostics, is to offer solutions. To offer solutions that allow doctors to meet the diversity of the patients that walk into their practice each and every day. And it starts with the Technus Multifocal Family uh, which provides very high quality vision, 2025 20, or better, across the full range of vision from distance to intermediate to near, uh, as well as very unique characteristics, including their depth of focus curves, uh, their optimal reading distances, and their visual disturbance profiles that allows doctors to personalize their choice for each and every patient that walks into their office. You also have to meet patients' needs, uh, and that comes down to enhanced functionality, not just providing outstanding visual acuity, but also meeting the demanding needs of the patients with respect to reducing the amount of dependence or the need for glasses following surgery. And as you can see from the two bars on the right, uh, nearly 98, or more than 98% of the patients reported never or sometimes requiring glasses following their surgery, and more than 60 percent of the patients with the lowest ad technus multifocal and three out of four patients with the 3.25 ad uh, reported never wearing glasses at all. It also comes down to the quality of vision and as you can see on the graph on the left uh, that translates into reduced visual disturbances, the ability to uh, perform daily tasks and uh, that translates into uh, Re improve patient satisfaction uh, with more than 90% of the low ad technus multifocal patients with the 2.75 uh, diopter ad reporting no uh, visual disturbances uh, with their or no problems with their night vision uh, almost 84% with the 3.25 ad and that compares very favorably uh, with the 86% in the monofocal control so the combination of a full range of vision uh, excellent quality of vision and reduced dependence on glasses translates into uh, between 94 and 97 percent of the patients saying they'd have the same IOL implanted if given the option again. So why 
So, so based upon this high level of patient satisfaction, as you can see in the chart here, uh, it has helped, each one of you has helped to establish Abbott as the market leader globally in presbyopic correcting IOLs since the middle part of last year. But with all these favorable trends, why the problems? And you can see here in the ASCRS survey in 2014, uh, limitations with respect to quality of vision at night, uh, limitations with respect to intermediate vision, and even hitting the target with respect to distance vision continued to present barriers. Uh, and that doesn't even include uh, some of the challenges uh, in each individual office with respect to progress of patients, progressing patients through the office, offering these types of solutions, uh, or being able to correct residual refractive error also pose problems. So what is it that AMO is doing? And I'd like to close with this slide. Well, we continue to develop new innovations that will continue to expand uh, the premium vision and the high quality of vision across um, near, intermediate, and distance with new technologies. We're also working on new technologies that will address patient categories that don't even have answers to their vision needs today. Uh, more to come on that in the future. We highly believe that partnerships with doctors to develop better training materials and education for this, as well as direct-to-patient awareness programs like we're doing in LASIK to drive the LASIK market uh, as well. And then finally, working with uh, industry and ophthalmology associations, legislators, uh, and uh, standards committees to continue to drive for expanded uh, access to patient shared billing in the future are keys to realizing the full potential of this category. Thank you very much. All right. so. I think David had a question. Yeah, yeah uh, Leonard, you know, with, uh, in terms of what's really holding back premium IOLs, uh, I think one of the, the key things from the IOL standpoint is the lack of something that enhances pseudophagic monovision. You know, if you look at the ASCRS clinical survey, uh, in 2013, uh, pseudophagic monofocal monovision was three times uh, higher, I think that's 2014, three times higher than pr uh, presbyopia correcting IOLs, and in 2014 it was four times higher. So that's even with the disincentive of doing just as much work and not being able to be uh, reimbursed as a premium channel, uh, it uh, outstrips that. So can you comment on Symphony, therefore, because uh, I think for or, or, you know, I, I think we're all anxious to see, uh, you know, new, new IOLs that can actually uh, piggyback with that. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, the first thing I would say about uh, the pseudophagic monovision is the 2013 survey, keep that number in mind. Uh, really, a lot of the technologies today for, for correcting presbyopia uh, really weren't available the low ad multifocals weren't available at that time. Some of the corneal technologies, the corneal technologies for correcting, um, for correcting presbyopia weren't available. And so I think what we're seeing is uh, old news. I'd love to see that survey today to see how that stacks up versus, uh, versus the technologies that are available today. But talking about the technologies available tomorrow uh, and Symphony particularly, let me start out by saying Symphony isn't approved in the United States, and because I have to say that. Um, it is approved outside the U.S., in Europe, uh, Canada, many of the Latin American and, and Asia Pacific countries as well, too. Uh, it is doing extremely well. You saw the, uh, the graph I put up with respect to market leadership and presbyopia control, uh, correcting IOLs. The Symphony experience outside the U.S. is a big part of that with the U.S. experience for Tectus Multifocal Low Ads in the U.S. as well. Uh, we've done probably the largest post-market study we've ever done in the history of AMO, regardless of what the A stood for, um, in, in terms of European experience, multi-country, multi-doctor, more than 600 patients uh, demonstrating really excellent uh, visual outcomes across near, intermediate, and, and or about, across distance, intermediate, and functional near, uh, as well as uh, what I hope to be an outstanding quality of vision profile as well, too. So more to come, uh, and uh, uh, we're, we're looking forward to continued success with that uh, product outside the U.S., uh, and uh, hopefully in the U.S., too. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you very much. All right, so last up is going to be Michael Onischek with Alcon, and he serves as the global franchise head for all of Alcon Surgical. Thank you. Thank you.
you, Elizabeth. Um, this is actually one of the first times that I'll address this audience. I joined Alcon uh, after a, a 10 year career with Boston Scientific. Uh, I love innovation, so I spent the majority of my career building companies. Uh, one of the companies was acquired by Medtronic, and today it's the largest spinal re reconstructive company in the world, Sophomore Danic. And then I built a neurostimulation company with Al Mann. Um, to build a neural stimulation company that does spinal cord stimulation and deep brain stimulation. To come into ophthalmology is like to come into a family and I've been very impressed over the course of the last year at how tight this, this industry is. It's impressive. It's also impressive as to how sophisticated uh, the optical system is and I, uh, I tell you the presentations this morning, uh, what you're working on is incredibly important to, to Alcon. What I did want to talk about is actually the evolution, right? We started with something that was about safety and efficacy and we've moved now to efficiency. Can we do more throughput? Can we uh, treat more patients? And now we're getting into this next level, which is really around refractive outcomes and can we actually nail what the patients expect every day? And I think it's interesting as we've had this conversation, um, our patients at the center of the conversation, right? If we think about penetrating the premium channel, we really need to be talking about what is the patient expectation and how involved are they gonna be in their own therapy? Um, is innovation all that we need to talk about to them or do we need to talk about other things with them as well? And then can they live independently? Can they live with the freedom without glasses? I'm always impressed by the number of folks in this audience who wear glasses. Some of them are on the stage. And, you know, we're, we're looking for refractive outcomes, right? Everybody is, but we're, we're still a little bit fearful that we may not get exactly what we expect. So what do companies need to do? Well, at Alcon, obviously, we continue to innovate internally and externally. We've made a number of short-term uh, investments. Last year, we launched a few products over in Europe, uh, Panoptics, which is a, a trifocal device, where we actually took a license from the University of Arizona, and we leveraged that into a product, and we're getting phenomenal results with that device. We're simplifying the procedure with uh, inserters, and we've launched that in the United States. We're looking at e EDF technologies as we go forward and some next generation platforms. And obviously, um, Barry Cheskin spoke a little bit about our relationship that we're building with his organization at Power Vision. We have a relationship with Clarivista and other startup companies. So, you know, Alcon is, is actively listening to the market. We're actively working with partners who are pushing the scientific boundaries of this industry. And we know that we can uh, develop things internally, but we're also going to need to partner with folks externally. There are a number of you who are sitting in this audience and uh, who've made a lot of money working with Alcon. Uh, if you look across our platforms, we've acquired a number of these technologies through the startups. And uh, the relationship that we've had is has been one that's really fascinating. Uh, the, the development of these technologies allowed us to advance into diagnostics, interoperative uh, aberometry. Tom, thanks for that. AMO, uh, you now have to figure out how to compete with me uh, on that side. We've had lasers that have been developed. Now it's about how do we bring it together so it's simple to use for the clinician so that they get what they want from the product. And Sabo Leone, who spoke before me, talked about how we're gonna integrate the suite to make it simple to use. It's taking the complex and making it simple. The next phase of this really is how do we bring technologies together or procedures together? Our acquisition of Transcend is an example of a, a joint procedure where we're gonna be doing surgical glaucoma management while we're doing an interocular lens exchange. I believe there's a place for drug delivery here. I believe there's uh, additional uh, minimization of trauma to the eye that we need to be doing as we move forward, both in the anterior and the posterior uh, portion of the eye. And so as we look forward as Alcon, I'm gonna ask my organization internally to be focused on integration and simplification and driving 
ease of use. We're going to still be looking to the landscape that's uh, the, the startup environment to help us continue to drive the scientific innovation. And obviously, it's a partnership with our physicians and even our competitors to work hard uh, to, to develop things like patient reported outcome tools and other things that'll help us advance the science of this industry. So I'd like to thank everybody for inviting me to speak and I look forward to meeting you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. So real quick, any questions from the, audience, from the panel? Yeah, I'll ask a, qu a quick question. And, and you know, Alcon has been the market leader in, in, in ophthalmic surgery for uh, as long as I've been an ophthalmologist. And um, uh, I think that you've developed some extraordinary technology. And I think that the rate limiting step right now is really the ophthalmologist has to be educated better on how to use the technology that's out there. And this doesn't apply to Alcon. It applies to every single company that's out here today, is that we need to get ophthalmologists better trained to use the technology to get better outcomes. Because I think that's really the rate limiting step. Tell us about Alcon's commitment to education. Yeah, I think it, you know, if you look at how you develop a market, first we have to understand what the needs of that market are. Uh, working with the training and teaching institutions around the world has got to be foundational for us, and we have to present ourselves and be more actively involved in that. I do think that these type of forums, not this day, but during this week where we're at major congresses, this is an opportunity for us to do peer learning and peer sharing. And I think our company and other companies need to actually create those environments where this type of uh, educational transmission can occur. And so Alcon is, is uh, broadly committed to this. We are going to double down our investment over the next couple of years because we think to move the needle in the premium channel does require greater and greater skills. Uh, not only do you need to learn what it is that's going well for you, but you need to have the information and the data as to how you can improve that. So some of the tools that we're working on to integrate the entire cataract suite will actually give you information to improve your surgical technique on, in the operation. We need to find a way to share that with you. So education has got to be foundational to advancing the premium channel. Excellent. If you don't mind, I also have a question. Um, does Alcon have anything in their research and development for new IOL material? Yeah, actually, we've got several IOL materials that we're currently investigating. A couple of my R&D engineers are here today. Uh, we think material sciences is something that we, we've, we've actually lacked uh, aggressively sharing with the marketplace what we're doing. Uh, last year, we, d we made a, an incremental investment in our R&D organization. We've got nine ongoing projects around material sciences and optical developments. Uh, and you'll start to see some of these going into commercial testing, or not commercial, but in scientific testing in 2000 and uh, late 16, early 17 around the world. So lots going on at Alcon right now. Great, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, so we are very close to wrapping up and not much time for discussion. Um, so you can't be in the hot seat for too much longer. So I've thought about the question that I would like to ask you guys. And I I'm gonna really focus on laser assisted cataract surgery simply because that technology above the others that we presented in the introduction, it really in four short years has had a nice incline in adoption if 10% of surgeries are being performed in that method. So tell me about your experience with it, um, barriers to entry, and why you think that this is really taken off rel relative to the other technologies. And, and I can start with, you know, Sherman, do you want to take that question? Um, yes, you know, so we have, uh, we have it in our practice as, as well. And, um, you know, uh, barriers will continue to be, at least initially, um, that it's not clearly clinically better. You know, there's the... Uh, uh, the Femto versus FACO paper that came out in the Blue Journal. And so that, that's going to be a, an issue in terms of convincing people that we should invest in the technology or buy the technology. I think that's, that's one, one key aspect that, that going forward we're going to have to look at. Gotcha. All right. And, and how long have you adopted? Uh, you know, we've, we've had it since the, the LensX came out, and then we got rid of the LensX, and now we have the Lens AR. And so it, it's been a part of our practice here for a, a couple of years at this point. Gotcha. Yeah. David? Do you use laser-assisted cataract surgery? So uh, I was in the SAB for Lens AR, but uh, in our practice, in our surgery center, we don't have a femtosecond laser, and we, we haven't. I think uh, in terms of barriers, if you just look around globally, mm -hmm. 
the adoption of femme de section really just correlates with the freedom within the given uh, economic system to build a patient uh, for the cost. So mm -hmm. in a socialized medicine country, it's not being adopted. Places like Australia, where the patient can pay extra mm -hmm. for anything, they, that's where some practices are at 90%. And of course, we have this hybrid. Mm -hmm. I think that's really the challenge. Uh, you know, because of the CMS ruling that performing steps of the cataract surgery is not something that we can bill the patient for, even though they may want it, and we may think it's better, uh, that really does put a big constraint on it, limits it to the premium IOL channel. Uh, and that's a, that can be, for many surgeons, a difficult sell in the lack, uh, given the lack of really good evidence that it can improve uh, refractive outcomes. So I think uh, that is the real conundrum yep. uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, I think, the major barrier. Denise, any comments? Um, I guess, that for at least for, for me, uh, femtosecond surgery wasn't better when I first got my femtosecond laser, and it's not going to be for anyone who acquires the technology until they learn how to use it. You have to gain experience with it. You have to incorporate your diagnostics. You also have to understand how they work, how your surgery affects things. So it's really a very uh, intensive learning process mm -hmm. to go from a, a blue-collar blue type basic cataract practice to a refractive cataract practice. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not an easy process. So you're not better when you first start doing femtosecond cataract surgery. In fact, you can't sell to patients that you are because you don't believe that you are, and in fact you're not. So you have to become better. And then after you are better, then you can deliver an amazing procedure to your patients with outstanding outcomes. So you have to go through the process first. Right. Well, and Denise, you bring up a good point. So then, Eric, I'm going to ask you slight, slightly differently. So knowing exactly what Denise said, I'm, I mean, are, have we made it so complicated? Have we self-imposed all these um, complex you know, checklists that make it difficult for surgeons to want to jump into the refractive cataract well, surgery space. I, I will, we'll look at topography. The, the fir my first topographer 20 some years ago had two pictures on it, one for the left eye and one for the right eye. Mm -hmm. And now I have four right. and I can get so many images for each eye that, uh, that I have paralysis by analysis sometimes when you want to decide what you want to do. So right. it is fairly complicated. Yep, Eric, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, and then um, I've certainly embraced femtosecond technology. We had one of the first units. Uh, we've been using it for six years. I've owned three different lasers. We, for the most part, use the catalyst now, but all these units work extremely well. And the logarithmic increase in quality of the procedure that I've seen in the last six years bodes extraordinarily well for the coming six years mm -hmm. that I think we'll see uh, continued improvement. And when I hear people talk about is femto surgery better than FACO, I'm always amazed that people always compare the best surgeons in the world, and I'm sitting here with some of the best surgeons in the world, and, and, they, and they can argue, I can do as good a job as, uh, with a FACO as with a femto, but raising the level of quality for every surgeon in the United States, every surgeon in the world, and making them better surgeons is our goal. It's not just making great surgeons better, it's making the average or the below average surgeon better. And in my practice, we have a microcosm. We have a lot of different ophthalmologists. We have 40 ophthalmologists in my practice. Some are great, some are good. But what I've noticed mostly is that the good surgeons are the ones who have really embraced the femto technology because they're the ones that have seen the incremental improvement in their refractive results, in lowering complication rate. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to look at femto second in a different way than we've looked at in the past. And for me, it's an extraordinarily bright future for this technology because it's making every surgeon better. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So we're here in a room with a bunch of innovators and the creme de la creme of surgeons. But what is the voice of the rank and file ophthalmologist and ASCRS, for example, saying? And this is where I think the clinical survey is so impactful um, to over 2,000 respondents. So this information is on, um, on over 2,000 responses. And looking at what are those clinical barriers and just a few short summary slides with regards to laser assisted cataract surgery, you know just like we talked about, cost and viable reimbursement streams. Three quarters of the respondents do not have confidence that there is a viable reimbursement uh, stream in order to justify the cost of the laser itself. And there's other uh, 
concerns, including the availability of clinical data, and a third of patients, or I'm sorry, a third of surgeons believe that there's not enough data um, or refractive advantages that have been uh, represented. And you know, patient flow and access are concerns, but on a bright note, the future confidence does not seem to be a significant barrier, and it seems to be that over 94% of surgeons feel that they will adopt this technology um, in the next decade or so. So surprisingly, with regards to toric lens adoption, it's very different. It's more clinical. So the acceptance um, of uh, rotational error, uh, about a third of the respondents believe that over 10 degrees of rotation does not affect outcome. And we know those who are doing toric lens implants, it certainly will. That's a third of your effectivity that is lost. And with regards to um, what should is uh, where should you utilize toric lenses? Half of the respondents would not implant a toric lens in someone with one and a quarter diopters of corneal astigmatism. Um, so education, again. And then diagnostic information selection, we're making it very confusing. There's not even half of the respondents that share a, a, a single uh, device diagnostically. And then, you know, surgeon-specific um, factors. So with regards to presbyopia correcting technology, cost to the patient is far and away the greatest barrier to further conversion. And then this is really concerning. From this, uh, even with all these newer uh, multifocal lenses that have a better profile, uh, their perceived loss of visual quality is a very significant barrier. And this is perceived by 41% of the respondents who feel that there is a significant worsening of contrast sensitivity once a multifocal lens impl is implanted. And then for anyone doing refractive cataract surgery, about half of them do not even know how to do LRIs or do not perform them regularly, either femto or, or manually. So there's a litany of reasons as we've discussed. There's technology limitations and there's implementation and practicality concerns, but there's something more granular. It's, it's with the surgeon. If 50% of surgeons are not performing LRIs, and this is an essential step into getting into refractive cataract surgery, then there's no way that they're gonna do anything else because how else are we gonna treat less than satisfied patients who have a little bit of residual mixed astigmatism. And so we really need to continue pushing education and addressing these barriers uh, clinically so that surgeons have that confidence and then industry will meet us with a better technology and better pathways. So thank you.